Philippians chapter number 11, and uh, let's all stand for a little bit together, and, and we'll read a couple verses here, and uh, we'll jump right into it. I want to talk to you tonight about the second judgment in our series on seven judgments, and that is a judgment of self. Now, if you ask somebody out in the world, should you judge yourself, they'll tell you, no, that's harmful, um, but that's, that's probably because of a misconception of what that term actually means. Um, and if you're lost without Jesus Christ, judging yourself doesn't do you any good. Uh, for the most part, it's, it's a fruitless endeavor. You just look at yourself and know there's something wrong, but until you can apply the solution, it doesn't fix you, right? So we're not talking about that. Uh, we're talking about a judgment that is for believers. I'm going to give you a couple of things here in a little bit after we read these, these verses um, that, that I want you to, to keep in mind about this particular judgment. Last uh, week, we talked about a judgment that was the judgment on sin at Calvary. And uh, that's in the past, but this is a different kind of judgment, all right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, and look at verse number 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. This is Paul. He was not one of the original disciples. He wasn't there the, for the Last Supper. So he's saying, look, I received this from the Lord. The Lord showed me this supernaturally revealed an event that I was not physically there to partake in. And this is what happened. And it, and it jives 100% with what you read in the Gospels. And he says this. He says uh, in verse 24, When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. Notice that in verse 28. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now when he says sleep, he's not talking about taking a nap. All right? And that's clear from other things we've looked at already in our study in Thessalonians. That's a sleep of the body. That means you died. All right? uh, but look at verse 31. I want you to pay attention closely to that. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chasing the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Father, we ask for your help tonight. I want to ask, Lord, one last time as we go to you in prayer, that you bless the message, bless the teaching. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to get this straight in our hearts and in our minds. And uh, Lord, help us not to get removed from this, or we need to... Learn to keep short accounts with you. And Lord, I pray that this teaching tonight would be one that makes sense to everybody and is one that is applied in everybody's life. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated if you would. Let me give you a couple things up front on this. Number one, let me give you five things if you're taking notes tonight. Number one, God is a God of judgment. God is a God of judgment. We've already talked about that. Uh, but God will always judge sin. Now, let me tell you something. In regards to the eternal part of you, if you're saved tonight... That has been judged at Calvary. Thank God for that. God's wrath was poured out on Jesus Christ. That's what we looked at last week. If you're saved tonight, it's not because you go to church or because you're Baptist or because you bring your family to church or anything else. It's because when Jesus Christ finished the work that he did on the cross of Calvary, you looked at that thing and you said, Lord, if your word is right and if your word is true, you said, whosoever will, let him come and taste of the water of life. Lord, I want what he did for me. I accept by faith what Jesus Christ did for my soul on Calvary. And you may not have understood this at the time that you accepted him, especially if you did this when you're five, six, or even 25 years old. But what the Lord did is he took your sin and put it on Jesus Christ, and he took his righteousness and his perfect life, and he put it on your account. That's a blessing. Amen. That's the judgment we looked at last week. All right? That's the eternal part of who you are. All right? God is the God of judgment. He always judges sin. God is not Santa Claus. And God is not a senile old man. I'm not trying to be blasphemous, but that's the, world, that's the way the world presents God. All right? God keeps track of things. 
All right, where you reap what you sow. Be not deceived, God's not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. All right, but I want to point something out about the judgment we're talking about tonight, and that is this. Not only is God a God of judgment, but secondly, the judgment we're talking about tonight is only for saved people. It is only for those who have first been to Calvary. If you haven't gone there, the judgment we're going to talk about tonight will do you zero good. You've got to start at Calvary. But here's the question, and it's a, it's a good question. When someone gets saved, they go, what happens after I sin again? How many of you struggled with the idea of whether or not you were really saved? Anybody in here tonight? At any point in your Christian life? You say, why? Because sin makes you doubt. That's why. When, you lit, when, 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 things get, when the laundry gets dirty, you doubt that you were ever clean to begin with. All right? But that doesn't mean you lost your salvation. There's a way to rectify this thing, and that's what we're going to look at tonight. All right, thirdly, this judgment is not a future one. It is a daily judgment that should take place in your life every single day. Paul says it like this. He says, I die daily. You say, why is that? Because every single day that you wake up, unfortunately, your body and your flesh is there, and it's trying to dictate what you're going to do as a child of God. And if you're not careful and you let your flesh lead, you get in a mess. You didn't lose your salvation, but you get in a mess. All right? Uh, so this is a, a daily judgment that should take place. I'll, I'll say it like this. Keep short lists. Keep short accounts with God. All right? Do you know what happens when you use a credit card? Over time, it builds interest. Do you know what happens when you sin and you don't confess it to the Lord and you keep sinning and you keep sinning? That, that builds interest over time. And not only are you pushing yourself further and further from God in your walk with Him, and here's what I want you to get. Your stand in Jesus Christ is at Calvary. You are sinlessly perfect in the sight of God when it comes to your soul. Say hallelujah for that. Amen. However, you're still in a body of flesh, and while this body of flesh does not determine whether you're saved or not, that's been settled at Calvary once you're saved. All right? However, this body of flesh does determine the kind of fellowship you have with your father. So your stand over here is at Calvary, but your state is over here in your flesh. And because you still sin, there is a need to get things cleansed with the Lord. There is a need to keep short accounts with God and to confess your sins. Let me, let me give you this extreme. There are two extremes when it comes to confession of sins. There are those that believe that the way you get saved is by confessing your sins daily. Wrong. You'll go to hell like a bullet. You say, why? Because that's not how anyone gets saved in the New Testament. You don't get saved by confessing your sins to God. Some of you look at me like a cat looking at a new fence. I'm telling you, that is not what the Bible says the salvation is. Salvation is coming. Listen, if salvation was based on you confessing your sins, what if you sin and you don't confess your sin? Do you die and go to hell? You see how that thing's tricky? The salvation is not about you confessing your sins. And boy, I'd like to teach on repentance tonight because I'm this close, because that's a subject everybody gets all, all, all out of whack. But salvation is not about confessing your sins. Salvation is about confessing Christ as your Savior. Amen. But after that, after you're saved, and you're trying to walk with the Lord, and you're trying to live a Christian life, you mess up. And we don't call those mistakes. We call them sins, because that's what the Bible calls them. And when you go, listen, there, there's that extreme. The other extreme is, I don't have to confess any of my sins because they're already under the blood of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something. You try that, and you see how filthy your mind gets after a while. Amen. You get callous towards sin. Something happens when you get down your knees, and the Lord says, now, son, I want to talk with you. And you go, well, Lord, this is what I was thinking about. And Lord, this is what my motive was. And boy, you feel dirty at the moment, but when you get up, it feels clean. Amen. You know what happens when you walk around with that all the time? There's guilt. God did not intend for a child of God to walk around with guilt. Amen. But guilt, I'm convinced, is the result of unconfessed sin. Let me give you this fifth point about this, and we're going to jump right into the rest of this message. All right, the very ordinance that's connected, the context of this entire conversation is the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is not a sacrament. Certain churches teach that. The Catholic Church is the primary one. They teach that it is the administration. All right. I named a name, right? The, they teach that, that when you take of that sacrament, all right, you are, you are taking part of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, 
and therefore you're receiving one of the graces by which you can get into heaven. If you looked with a magnifying glass and you looked in Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and English, which is what God gave you, and anywhere else, you know what you're going to find? It doesn't say that. It says that it is a memorial to show the Lord's death until he come. So the context of this entire conversation is remembering the Lord's death because he's coming back. In light of the fact that he died for you, in light of the fact that he's coming back, you ought to be living right. How do you do that if you don't confess your sins? So the whole idea here tonight is this. When it comes to partaking in the Lord's Supper as an example of this, and, and the Lord's Supper, another word for that is communion. Why do we call it that? Because communion is fellowship with somebody. When you are walking in communion with somebody, you are communicating with them. And so to be in fellowship with the Lord and to partake in the Lord's Supper when you've got unconfessed sins and things going on in your life that aren't right and you're bitter towards your brother in Christ and you haven't forgiven your spouse and you and your kids aren't right and you and your boss aren't right and you're not living right. Hey, listen, that's not wise to partake in the Lord's Supper without first confessing where you've been wrong. And let me say this, you shouldn't wait to the Lord's Supper to take care of those things. That should be a daily thing. I heard someone one time say, well, the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver, so when the offering plate passes by, if I'm not cheerful, I shouldn't give it. No, give it and then get it right later. <laughs> so, so, no, no, I'm serious. Okay, so, so for example, come to the Lord's Supper, well, I just won't participate because I've got unconfessed sins. You're a fool. Don't be proud. Confess that you're wrong, get it right, and then partake in the Lord's Supper. That's how that thing's supposed to work. And when it comes to your fellowship with Jesus Christ, you need to understand that God, while he did put those sins in regards to your soul on his account, when it comes to your ability to have a clean relationship with the Lord in the body of flesh, guys, the Bible says that your body is a, is a, 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 a vessel, an earthen vessel where God places his treasure. What is that treasure? Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so this is the vessel that God has chosen to place the Holy Spirit inside of. So then you know what he says, I'd like to get closer to you in the vessel that you exist in. The part of you that's eternal, we're already good with that. But the part of you that you're living with right now, we got to work on that. Amen. <laughs> He's still working on me to make me what I remember that song. That's not just for kids. That's for us, man. You say, why? Because he's working on us, and he's trying to work from the inside out, Jesus Christ being conformed in our life, more and more, our own image disappearing, and his image coming out. That doesn't happen when you sin and it's not confessed. It doesn't work that way. Let me put it to you like this. You are adopted into the family of God, but you have not fully re yet received your adoption. <laughs> That's what Romans 8 talks about. We looked at that last week. If you're taking notes, Romans 8, 15 through 23. And let me say this. As a child of God, you won't lose your salvation because of sin. But let me give you some things you will lose. You'll lose rewards. You'll lose your fellowship with Jesus Christ. You'll lose your testimony. You'll lose power with God. You know what the church today is? It's powerless. You say, well, I don't, just, I don't mean new heights. I just mean the church at large. I mean, Christians, they're powerless. You say, why? Because so much of the world has infiltrated their lives, the way they think, the way they talk, the way they look, and, and sin is there, and no one even acknowledges that it's there, and they won't confess it to God, because there's one of two extremes. Again, there's the extreme that goes, okay, I think I have to confess my sins to stay saved, and there's this one over here that says, nope, it's uh, already taken care of at Calvary. I don't have to confess any of my sins. That's foolish. It'll ruin your opportunity to shine for Jesus Christ and win people to Him. So what am I saying? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let me give you an example of this thing that I'm talking about when it comes to your salvation. Now, there may be some here tonight that come from a different background. You may come from a different denomination or no denomination at all. I heard a comedian recently say, uh, how many denominations we got here tonight? You know, one person's Baptist, one person's this. One person's like, non-denomination is like, you're not fooling anybody. You're just Baptist with a cool website, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, you may have come from a different background where maybe you thought or you were taught that you could lose your salvation. I don't believe that my salvation is secure because I'm a Baptist. It's not why. Now, I'm a Baptist because I believe that. But I believed it first because the Bible is the final authority. <laughs> right. 
You know what the beauty of independent Baptists are? For some of you that don't know what I'm talking about, the beauty is we don't have an ecclesiastical head or pope or anything saying, this is what you got to believe. There's the Bible, and there's the Holy Spirit of God to teach you. And you got a pastor in this local church to teach you, but that's it. All right, look, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, and look at verse number... Go learn some Bible tonight. That's good. Now look at, uh, look at verse number uh, 11. It is a faithful saying, and for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, now Peter addresses this thing, and the way that Peter talks about it, I'm going to give you the modern, I'm going to give you the modern uh, colloquial version, all right? By the way, these people that write new Bibles, they never really actually make it where, I mean, here's what's funny. I'm just going to side note this. I've heard people say that this Bible is too hard to understand, and you know what I've learned? The people that believe this book are the ones that preach it very plainly where you can get it. And the people that cling on to new versions and make it easier to understand, they're always talking in a language that I don't get. Isn't that something? Yeah. All right, now, now look, at, uh, look at verse number 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. I'll never forget, it was just a couple months ago, I was sitting down with somebody and showing them this verse. He goes, see, he'll deny you. You'll lose your salvation. I said, hold on there, Tonto, hold on. I said, look at the first part of the verse. What is being denied? Is it your salvation? Or is it your opportunity to reign with him? In the millennium. Now look at the next verse. If you're not clear on it yet, look at verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. Why? Once you're saved, you're placed in the body of Christ. You're, you're much, it's like saying the Lord just lost his hand because you lost your salvation. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> all right? Because you're in Christ and Christ is in you. Therefore, he cannot deny himself. And when God the Father looks at you, He sees the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, for eternity in you, even though you may not see that in your flesh. When God looks at you, the eternal part of you, that's what He sees. Therefore, He cannot deny Himself. You're not going to lose your salvation. However, in verse 12, you lose the opportunity to reign with Him. What is that? That is a reference to your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. That's yet another judgment we're going to look at. But the point is this, you don't lose your salvation, but there are some things you can lose out on. All right, now let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, and let's point out a couple things here tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, number 1, let's talk about the people involved in this chapter. The people involved in this chapter in reference to judging yourself. And, and by the way, let me say this, if you spent a little more time judging yourself, you'd be a lot more hesitant in judging others. I've learned that. All right, and that's for free. All right, number one. Number one is the people involved in the chapter. All right, who's the author? The author is the Apostle Paul. You know what that is? That's a saved follower of Jesus Christ. That is an apostle, as the Bible calls him, as he says of himself, as one, in 1 Corinthians 15, as one born out of due time. You say, what is that? He's talking about his apostleship. He's an apostle that comes after the rest of the apostles says he is one born out of due time, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He's writing this letter to the church of Corinth. You know what that means? He's talking to saved people. All right, go back, if you would, to uh, chapter 11. Look at verse 1. Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. You could tell a lost person to follow you as, as you follow Christ, and they'll still go to hell. You say, why? Because they haven't trusted Christ yet. <laughs> then you get saved. Now go back to the very beginning of 1 Corinthians. Look at chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So we, we know who the, the writer is. The writer is Paul. Look at verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2. Unto the church of God which is at Corinth. Say, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Listen, guys. With all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Is that you tonight? That is you. You did that. So guess what? This involves you. Paul wrote something to some Christians 2,000 years ago that still applies to this day, and you're reading about it. So the author is the Apostle Paul. Let me go a step further. Really, the author is the Holy Spirit of God, all right? But he uses a human instrument named Paul to write this letter, and he writes this to Christians. I want to make that clear. This judgment is not for the lost. This judgment does not have to do with someone that's lost trying to get saved. This has to do with someone that's already part of the body of Christ. They've been baptized into His Spirit, not by water, but when they trusted Him as Savior, chapter number 12 of 1 Corinthians, uh, 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 in, same, same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So the point is this, we're talking about saved people, all right? 
And uh, let me say this, the Lord does give warnings to two groups of people in this chapter. He will give a warning to those that are lost, who are partaking in the Lord's Supper. That may not be good. Is that okay? Okay, no, 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 that's okay. That's all right. That's all right. That's what mommies are for. Can I say this? We've been a church here for eight years. And in eight years, the fact that that doesn't happen more often, <laughs> that's a miracle. That's a miracle. Uh, but uh, here's the point, guys. There's a warning in this chapter to those that are lost that are partaking in the Lord's Supper. But you know what they're told? To examine themselves in light of the Lord's Supper. But in regards to, look if you would at verse number 31, Paul's not, when Paul says we, let, let me say it to you like this. When I'm preaching to lost people, do you know what I don't do? I don't say if we would just receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we could be saved. You know why? I'm already saved. And these preachers are always saying, we, we, we. I always, why, why are you saying we, man? Are you saved or not? Right. You know, like if you're saved, you know what it is? Preachers are scared to say you. That's right. That's right. Now listen, I'm not saying to be offensive, but if you're lost, you need to be saved. Yeah. Right. I don't need, I've already done, taken care of that. I've got a lot of other issues, but I don't got that one, amen? So when Paul says, if we, look at verse 31, if we would judge ourselves, you've got the, the author and the reader included. You say, who are the saved people? It's critical to understand God has always provided an outlet for fellowship with Him. And what we're dealing with tonight primarily is fellowship with the Lord. All right? So number one, the people. You see Paul the Apostle, saved man, writing the saved people in the church of Corinth. Secondly, let me give you this, the purpose. The purpose behind this self-judgment. Now let me uh, take you to 1 John chapter number 1. Go to 1 John chapter 1. And let me say this, first off, the purpose here is restored fellowship with the Lord. A restored fellowship with the Lord. 1 John, look if you would at 1 John chapter number 1. 1 John chapter number 1. And uh, uh, look if you would at verse number 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Now if you're not sure what that is, that is a reference to Jesus Christ. In your Bible, in your King James Bible, when the word Word is capitalized with a capital W, that's a reference to a person. All right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so what John is talking about, and you may not, you may not know this, some of you do and some of you may not, but in the early church, there were those that were trying to creep into the church. There were those who believed in something called Gnosticism. In other words, they believed if it was material, if it was physical, it could not be of God. Therefore, if God shows up in the flesh, it wasn't actually God. That's why uh, John, in 1 John, writes about, you know, he that believes that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and confesses that is not of Antichrist, but he that believes not is of Antichrist and all that kind of stuff. So when John is writing this thing, he's talking about Jesus Christ, and he's talking about having fellowship with him. Look, if you would... Down at verse number uh, 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declaring you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. You know what sin is? Sin is darkness. Even in the life of a believer, sin is darkness. And, and look what it says in verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, the context is not salvation. The context is fellowship. It's, it's you having a real relationship with Jesus Christ. I referenced this recently in our study in Thessalonians. Paul says in Philippians that I may know him. He's already saved. He knows the Lord as his Savior. He's saying, I want to know him intimately. I want to get closer to him. I want my flesh to die a little bit more today. I want to hate sin a little bit more today. I want to sin less today. Have you ever prayed in the morning, God, help me to sin less today. Listen, that's not a bad idea. We say, God, feed my family. God, take care. Nothing wrong with that. God, uh, pay my bills. Lord, help me pay my bills. You may spend about 10, 15 minutes on that subject. Amen. <laughs> and at the end, go, Lord, please forgive me all my sins. And let me say this. I would suggest when you confess your sins, you name them. You parents. When your kid goes, sorry. Let me, let me, my dad was really interesting like this. He would say, no, no, no. Don't say sorry. No, no, no. You say, perdóname. <laughs> he was going back to the original Spanish, you know, and you say, why is that? Because perdóname, while it does mean sorry, if you translate it in English, it means something a little bit deeper than that. It means forgive me. 
And then you get into, well, what do you need to be forgiven for? My kids sometimes, you know. They say, sorry, Dad. What do you say sorry for? Dad, you know. <laughs> now you say, you doing that to torture them? No, I want them to get a principle. I want them to understand. Look, if you took the time to make that sin happen, take the time and the five seconds that it takes to say, Lord, here's what it was. I'm sorry. Call it what it is. All right? Now, you say, what does that do? It restores fellowship. Look, if you would, at verse number 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. You ever find yourself coming to church and going, I don't like these church people? Do <laughs> you ever think maybe it's not everybody else? You ever, think maybe, you ever think maybe some of it's you? I'm not saying all of it, but maybe, maybe some of it's you. Now, we all got issues, and we all got our problems, and I'm sure we do enough to offend each other, but the point is this. You will not have close fellowship with God or His people when you've got unconfessed sin in your life. You say, how do you know? Look at verse number 8. If we say, that, or verse 7, I'm sorry, in, his blo- in the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son cleanses us from all sin. Thank God for that. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Even after you're saved. Listen. Your sins have been paid for at Calvary, and when it comes to the eternal part of you, that's, that's one thing. When it comes to your fellowship on a daily basis, you look at God and say, there's nothing in my life. <laughs> look at verse number 8. Or verse number, uh, yeah, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not as, you're not just deceiving, you're not deceiving anybody else, you're deceiving yourself. That's dangerous. Verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, look at this, He is faithful and just, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some unrighteousness. That's not what it says, though. You know what it says? All unrighteousness. Now, why would you have a promise from God like that and leave that thing on the table? Why would you do that? Why would you have the Lord telling you, look, if you confess this thing, I'll clean it up. I'll, I'll, listen, yeah, it's, it's been taken care of at Calvary as far as your soul is concerned, but as far as your fellowship with me, it doesn't work that way. Listen, as far as my kids are concerned, I will never have them doubt whether they're my children because of the way that they act. If you do as a parent, shame on you. Amen. You don't go, I don't know if you're really a Dominguez because the way you're acting right now. (laughs) How old are you for saying something like that? I don't ever look at my kid and go, I wonder if you're really mine because the way you're acting. You know what I do say? We're not going to be on speaking terms right now. And it's not because of me. I haven't moved. I'm in the same place I've always been because of what you did. Now, you want to make it right? Let's talk. And let me tell you something I do with my kids. Once they've confessed it, you know what I tell them? It's under the blood. It's gone. Dad's not bringing it up again. Why? Because I don't want them to look at God and go, God is this, dad, is this father up there waiting for me to mess up, and he keeps bringing up the old stuff I did wrong. That's what the devil does, not the Lord. So the point is this. You can have restored fellowship with Jesus Christ as a result of confessing your sins. Let me say this as well. It keeps your eyes on Jesus Christ. I read a story about a young boy who's going to a parochial school. Hey, buddy. He's going to parochial school, and, uh, you know, if, you're t- if you remember, some of you may have come from this background. In the Catholic Church, you confess your sins to a, an earthly father, right? And so this boy gets in the confessional booth, and he starts saying, Father, please forgive me, for I have sinned. I lied to my parents. I disobeyed my mom. I fight with my brothers and my sisters. And all of a sudden, there's this long pause. Wait, this isn't my list. Whose list is this, the boy says, you know. And you say, what is that? He got too busy, and he was listing out someone else's faults. Now, you know what happens when you spend more of your time listing out other people's faults? You don't have your eyes on Jesus Christ. I've heard Christians go, you know, if you could just do this, if, if, if everybody else could just straighten out all these things, and then we could get things. No, 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 no. If that's the way you're living the Christian life, you're never going to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. You know what will help you keep your eyes on Christ? Confessing your sins daily. Getting to a place where you're not bringing a laundry list of what somebody else is doing wrong. Now, let's face it. Sometimes it's like this. You know, it, comes, it starts off innocent. Lord, please uh, be with my husband and watch over him and help him. And Lord, help him keep his mind right. And Lord, you saw what he did the other day. You know that wasn't right. And God, uh, he, he really needs you because you saw that the way he handled that situation. And Lord, I was just pouring out my heart and he hurt my feelings. And before you know it, you're going on for 10 minutes about what's wrong with your husband. 
Now, I don't need a show of hands tonight, but I think we understand this is something that is sometimes commonplace within Christian life. You say, what's the problem? You got your eyes too much on people and you won't get them on Jesus Christ. But when you confess your sins to the Lord, and a, 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 a natural uh, pr- a, 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 a byproduct of that is that your eyes are recentered on Jesus Christ. All right, let me give you this as well. You'll, igno- you'll learn to acknowledge what the issue actually is. It'll keep you humble. Look at James chapter number 4. James chapter 4. You know, when you confess your sins and you list them out to God, and you keep short accounts with God, you know what you ought to do? The wrong thought comes in your head, and you start dwelling on that thing, right away you go, Lord, I was, I'm sorry. Now, I believe, I'm, I'm one of those people, I believe at the end of the day, you look over your day and go, Lord, help me, Lord, I did this wrong, this wasn't right, and Lord, I want to do better in this area. Nothing wrong with that, but you know what? I'm going to advocate something a little bit more than that. I'm going to advocate, rather than waiting until the end of the day, when that thing happens, when the Holy Spirit shows you it's wrong, say, Lord, I'm wrong. Lord, I should not have said that to my spouse. I shouldn't have reacted that way to my kid. I shouldn't have said that to my boss. I shouldn't have lied about that. I shouldn't have... You see what happens after a while? You go, oh, that's just a little white lie. It's sin, guys. And that thing builds over time. And, and if you learn to just deal with it right away, you're acknowledging the issue for what it is. It'll keep you humble. Look at James chapter 4. But he giveth, verse 6, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore, you want more grace in your life? I do. Say why? Because I need it. <laughs> he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Andrew Murray said, The humble man feels no jealousy or envy. He can praise, other, uh, praise God when others are preferred and blessed before him. He can bear to hear others praise while he is forgotten because he's received the Spirit of Jesus who pleased not himself and who sought not his own honor. M. R. DeHaan, another man, said this, uh, humility is something we should constantly pray for, yet never thank God that we have. Now, you know what happens when you learn to confess your sins with the Lord and keep short accounts? It sort of keeps you in check. It sort of keeps you, it keeps you from going, I'm not like those people. And I don't, you know, you know I don't get me on that. You know, I, I don't do this. Whatever this is, and you can fill in the blank. And the reality is every single one of us We'll look at someone else and a problem they have and go, I don't do that. (laughs) But there's a thousand other things I just confessed to God and Lord, I'm, you know, I need to deal with that right now and I don't need to be looking at what somebody else is doing or what. You see, it'll keep you humble and you need humility in your life. I've met some Christians, they're experts on what everybody else needs to do. And they've got it all figured out for everybody else. Can I say this? It'll help you to keep in your lane as a child of God. Learn to confess your sins. Let me ask you this. Do you want God to reveal things to you from His, from his Word? Amen. Look at Daniel chapter number 9. Daniel chapter 9. I've heard people say, I'm reading my Bible, not getting anything out of it. Now, you know what a fun, sometimes a fundamental Baptist preacher will do? Well, are you saved? You know what? I don't want to retread you every time you've got a problem in your life. Let's retread Jesus in your life and you get saved 50 times, you know? I don't believe that's the answer. I believe sometimes the answer is, Well, what is going on in your life that you haven't dealt with God about? What's the room that that the Lord can walk into any room in your house spiritually, in your your heart? He can go into the room of of the job or the the room of family or the room of finance, but he can't go into the room of my kids. Or he can go in the room of my kids, but he doesn't need to touch my job. If Jesus affects my job, that's not allowed. Do you understand what I'm saying? If there's a place like that in your life, oftentimes there's things you're just not going to get out of the Bible. And you'll come to church, newsflash, you'll be bored to tears at church. Why? When everybody else is going, amen, hallelujah, and they're getting something, you're going, I don't get anything. This preacher stinks. <laughs> and maybe he does, but maybe, maybe it's sin in your life you're not confessing. Look at Daniel chapter number 9. Daniel chapter 9, look if you would at verse number 3. You know what Daniel's doing here? He's confessing the sins of his country and of, and of his own. Daniel chapter 9, look at verse 3, and I set my... You know what would be good? For us to go, Lord, it, uh, instead of saying, man, those stupid liberals. Oh, those tree huggers, they're ruining everything. And those people in the education system, they just... Oh, those stupid politicians. They, Lord, the problem with our country is we love sin too much. Lord, I love sin too much. And I laugh at stuff that makes you blush. And, Lord, I look at stuff that would make you throw up. And, Lord, I'm thinking about stuff that you get grieved by. 
And Lord, I'm proud. And I don't think I need to be taught by anybody. That's the sin of America, and that's the sin in your life. You know what Daniel does? Daniel does exactly that. Look at verse number 3. I set my face unto the Lord to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting. That's how you know Daniel wasn't a Baptist. Amen. He gave up food for a little bit and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord. And he goes on to talk with the Lord. Look at verse 5. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces as at this day. And he goes on, look at verse 10, Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. He goes on and on and on, and look if you would at verse number 20. Wiles, I was speaking. You say, that's country talk, Wiles. You ever talk to someone from the South? You know where get that from? The Bible. And whilst I was speaking and praying, look at this, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before Lord God, a Lord my God, for the holy mountain of my God, yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and he informed me and talked with thee. And you know what he does? He reveals something to Daniel that nobody in Daniel's generation ever got. Do you think maybe some of that had to do with the fact that he was willing to confess his sins? If you ever get in your Bible and you go, Lord, I'm just not getting anything out of it. There's nothing here. Might it be you need to do some inventory and say, Lord, your book is perfect. And it is always light. And it is always something. There's always something in there for me. And Lord, if I'm not getting something right now, Lord, would you show me what's wrong with me? Amen. It's been said the Bible doesn't need to be rewritten. It needs to be reread. And when you approach truth and wanting truth for your life, you say, I need, to make a, I need to make a decision. Do I take this job? Do I not? Do I buy this car? Do I not? Do I buy this house? Do I not? Do I marry this person? Do I not? Do I? So on and so forth. You want clarity in a moment where you need discernment? Can I tell you something you better learn to do? Confess your sins. Because you approach that thing and you've got stuff going on in your heart, you've got stuff going on in your mind, and you haven't dealt with it, you're not going to have the clarity you need to make the right decision. Look at Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to stop here tonight. There's some other things in here that we're going to look at. We'll have to split this up into two parts. I'd rather do that than rush through the rest of this because I think it's important for you to get it. Uh, but look at Matthew chapter number 7. And let me give you one of the last purposes that we're going to look at tonight. The last purpose we'll look at tonight in regards to why you should confess your sins. Let me say this. It'll help you help others. Right. It'll help you help others. Look at Matthew chapter number 7. Do you ever think maybe you're not here just for you? Oh, that's a start. That's a God's concept, you know. <laughs> we try to teach our kids the world doesn't revolve around you, you know. And in our prayer life, it's like, Lord, give me this. Lord, give me that. Lord, help me. You know what I mean? It, it's almost like we have to be taught as adults, as children of God, hey, maybe the hardship you're going through is to help somebody else. Maybe the reason you haven't gotten past that hurdle is because you've got to come back and confess this thing that isn't right between you and the Lord so that eventually, maybe months or years later, when someone else is struggling, you can help them. Now, I understand I am opening myself up to spiritual cops coming in the room. You say, what is a spiritual cop? Someone that says, get down. You've got unconfessed sin. I know exactly what it is. I want you to spit it out right now in the name of Jesus. All right, we don't need that in the church. But I will say this, there are times when you're going to have a relationship built with another brother or sister in Christ where you can't help them where they're struggling. And the only way for you to do it the right way, look at Matthew chapter number 7. This is a famous verse that people love to quote, but they don't read the rest of the passage. Matthew chapter number 7, look at verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. Done, that settles it. You should never judge anything as long as you live. I'm going to challenge you tonight. When you drive home tonight and you go through that red light, don't judge the color. Don't discriminate the colors. Don't judge anything. Matter of fact, you see that red light, and if it really means green to you, just go through it. <laughs> if, if the way that you were raised and, the, the, and like you're, you're, you know, hey, look, I'm colorblind, right? And so I see no color, so it's green, so I'm just going to go, you're fool. You're going to drive through a red light and probably get killed. 
or risk getting hurt or hurting somebody else. You say, why? Because you're supposed to make judgments as a child of God. The place that you start is not with everybody else, though. The place that you start is with you. You know what Jesus Christ says in the Gospel of John? Judge righteous judgment. You know what Paul, the guy that writes 13 books in your New Testament says? He says, he which is spiritual, I'd like to be spiritual, he which is spiritual judgeth all things. He goes on to say this in Thessalonians, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. You know what that means? You've got to judge things. But you know where you start? You don't start out there. You start here. Look at, verse, uh, look at verse number two. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of my wife going, oh, you've got a pimple on your head. Let me just get... You leave my head alone. You know, so I'll be sitting in public and, hey, honey, this, hey, man, we're in public. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Quit judging me. <laughs> Pop your own pimples, you know. But, but look what he says here. Look what he says in verse 5. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam of, thy, of thine own eye. Does he put a period there? Is that where the verse ends? You say, why? Because there's a principle here. And then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Let me, here's what I've learned. When you learn to confess your sins and someone else is struggling, you don't go in with guns blazing. Pop, 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 pop. Let me tell you what your problem is. You need to get right with God. You know what you learn to do? You go, man, I tread real lightly. You say, why? Because if it's not for the grace of God, there I go. I, and I've been struggling with my own things. And I've been talking to the Lord about those on a daily, on a minutely basis. And when somebody else is struggling, I don't go in with guns blazing. You know, let me tell you what your problem is. I've seen Christians do that and run people off. It's not our place. But I'll tell you what you have opportunity to do is when someone's struggling, go, man, let me tell you what, I, what God did in my life. Let me tell you how I got over this. Let me tell you how I've gotten past this. And, and, and listen, it's a hard thing. It's not easy. I've learned to tell Christians there's no silver bullet. There's none. But you know what I'm getting at, guys? You know what Thomas does? My Lord and my God. What is that? That's a confession. You know what Peter says? Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. You know what Paul says? A saved man. O wretched man that I am. You know what those are? Those are confessions, guys. You know what you need to learn to do as a child of God if you want to have fellowship with him, if you want to be able to help other people, if you want to get something out of the word of God? Learn to confess your sins. We'll dig into this a little bit more next week, but I, I, I hope that tonight has at least given you a foundation in regards to what it means to have a little bit of self-judgment in your life as a child of God. It is a daily thing. It's not, listen, Calvary's one and done. Hallelujah for that. But the Christ, Jesus says this, if any man will come after me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. If you're fighting sin and you're fighting that thing in your flesh, and you don't learn to surrender the Holy Spirit and confess where it's wrong, you'll never get past it. You won't have fellowship with the Lord. And you'll walk around as a saved person with guilt, the same kind of guilt that lost people do when you have no business doing that. So Christian, I hope this helped you out tonight. Let's all stand.